everyone. Thank you for visiting my channel. My name's Lara and if it's your first time here, thank you and welcome to the channel. I am a psychotherapist and adoptee well-being researcher. My research was entitled Well-being in Adults Adopted as Infants and Babies, What Can We Learn? And the research looked into um, how well adoptees go on to achieve well-being later on in their lives. Um, this was a topic very close to my own heart and, um, and as we now know and um, as the years have gone by and the research is starting to come out and this topic is starting to come out even more, which I'm very happy to, to note, um, it's a, a, a topic that touches most of us and I would, I would argue all of us whether we're aware of that um, at some point in our lives or not, that's a different question. But adoption absolutely affects people and to certainly impacts their, ab their ability to go on and achieve well-being in their lives. So some of the findings of my research were really key and crucial around the openness of um, communication within the family during the, um, during the childhood and adolescence. Um, specifically around the formation of identity and around differences and that kind of a thing. I have got a video dedicated to that, which I will link um, up above. Um, I just wanted to say with this video, thank you for so many of you. I'm getting emails and contact weekly um, from so many people saying how um, heartening it is and how grateful and thankful um, you are for just having this topic out there and I think this is one of the core issues is that the struggles of adoptees um, are so so deeply hidden um, and buried within society and sort of under the radar um, and that is what I and people like me and the people that I collaborate with and work with are striving to change. Um, my own personal goal is that in years to come this isn't just you know, reserved for people who have researched adoption or that actively spend time looking into what issues come out of adoption. Um, my hope and dream is that one day everyone will understand that yes, adoptees can go on to adjust well and, um, and do well in their lives, but there is a struggle and that that should be acknowledged. That should not be something that adoptees have to live with like a dirty secret. Um, and that, you know, for very many um, adoptees, when they do dare to broach that subject, they're met with ignorance or worse, um, invalidation. Um, so that's my own personal goal. And I suppose this channel does something to um, work towards that goal for me. You know, I know it's only a very small channel, but it's really important for me that people become more aware of, of the struggles of adoptees and that that's not seen as something that one or two or just you know a difficult child is is struggling with it affects all of us um so yeah so that's that's what this is all about and that's what the um why i looked into the research that was my own particular sort of um quest really was to find out how well adoptees adjust um so many of you have written to me and um and said how important it is to have that acknowledged. And um, I, I understand, I really, really understand that. Um, it's super important to have that acknowledged because you know when we feel something and uh, when we look around us, things may seem on the surface to be fine. They may seem to be, you know, we're doing well, we've got a family who's treating us well and all of that kind of thing. Yet the feelings are inside of us. and it's very difficult to kind of explain those away to ourselves, let alone anyone else. Um, and you can end up just feeling a kind of flawed, um, a bit broken, a bit kind of substandard actually um, in many occasions and, and not really understanding why that is. So I think why people find so much value in it is because, you know, finally I think it's about having somebody confirm back to you or validate your feelings. And um, as humans, that's probably one of the most important things um, because even though when we do the work on ourselves we try not to compare ourselves you know, you know there is a, a lot of in psychology around let's not compare ourselves to others but unfortunately it's, it's a human trait um, and so to feel as though there's nobody by which you can sort of measure yourself or have that kind of gauge of what is normal let's say um, is a very lonely place to be and maybe this goes some way to helping people feel part of something greater. 
I know that's not the case for all, all people. Um, the subject of adoption, the subject of well-being in adoptees um, is sometimes very divisive, unfortunately, and it's certainly a motive. Um, but that's just, that's part of the territory. And uh, I will carry on putting out what I know to be true. One of the um, topics that has come up a lot um, through the emails that I'm getting, I mean, just this week, I've had emails from the United States, Australia and Germany. Um, and one theme that keeps on coming up is, and, and they're not all from adoptees, actually, they're very often I'm getting contact from partners of adoptees. Um, and that is because relationships for adoptees um, are, let's say, can be quite tricky. They can be complex. Um, they're not just like friendships. They are different. Um, and it's within our most personal and intimate relationships that our greatest insecurities um, play out. And so unfortunately for those who spend their lives or part of their lives with us, that can be really painful and confusing. Um, and one of the things that I'm, as I say, hearing a lot of is um, I'm getting contact from the partners of adoptees who are just confused by the behaviours and the actions of their adoptee partners and the ones they love who um, shut down or who after, you know, what seems to be quite a healthy on the surface of it relationship. I mean, all of these things are very subjective and I can never say, you know, without looking at the ins and outs of a relationship, whether a relationship is healthy um, and uh, not codependent, that kind of thing. But adoptees do tend to go into, or very often go into relationships with a need. Um, and the need is that they are searching for something outside of themselves. We search for something outside of ourselves um, because we don't have it within us. And my belief and, and some of the evidence points to that being as a result of um, the separation early on and that need to, yeah, essentially um, fight and survive um, and, I think whilst it's a great survival tool to have to sort of manage those early days and weeks and years, yes, potentially being cared for, but there is, you know, the bond, the, the breakdown of the bond means that that child is suffering from um, separation trauma. And it's that very trauma that can go on to result in uh, a lack of um, a sense of safety within the self, if that makes sense. And so it's not just adoptees, you know, many adults um, and people have that issue, but adoptees have that issue. Um, and so when you go into a relationship very often as an adoptee, you're looking for that partner to replace something or to provide something that you that you don't have within yourself. And this is why those relationships can go along for a while or they break down very often. And, you know, adoptees get into sort of cyclical relationships. Um, and it's not that there's anything wrong with the person that they're with. It's not anything wrong with the relationship itself, actually, in many cases. It's that it could never work until that individual, that adoptee, um, has found that sense of groundedness and sort of security within themselves. In my view, that's how relationships need to be to work in, the, in any case, regardless of who you are. But the feature that we have as adoptees very often is that sense of... Um, unbelonging which is a word that I use a lot and um, comes up in my own memoir which I'm, I'm working on at the moment getting closer but this sense of um, trying to kind of um, anchor into something outside of, of the self um, and it's very very problematic but yes it hurts people it can leave people feeling confused and upset and I am hearing from many of you um, who are going through that situation and, and it's very sad. Therapy can certainly help but but really, it's about doing the work um, with the self. And one of the things that I have found unhelpfully for many, I'm sure to hear this, but one of the things that I have found to be the most powerful is actually going through the pain of being as an adult um, on, on one's own um, for a period of time. Because it's through that that you actually have to go through, if you like, the withdrawal. Because relationships are in some ways sort of like a drug in because you know you can be seeking something, you get a hit of something within the relationship as an adoptee, um, but it's not sustainable. And so when you're on your own as an adult, you have to go through that pain and there is like a withdrawal, um, but it's, th it's in that space, it's in that moment, in that time, however long that takes, and that's for different people. It's through that that you can um, 
break out of this sort of codependency patterns and have relationships that feel more autonomous and, and healthy. You know, being with somebody because you like them as a person and you, you like their qualities as opposed to what they can give you as a person, um, w which you're lacking for yourself. So it's kind of that thing um, really that is, is absolutely crucial. Unfortunately, that does mean that, you know, some relationships do, do break down. And um, as I say, unfortunately, statistically with adoptees, that, that tends to be um, kind of one of those things, the sort of the fallout, if you like, of, of you know, the, the difficulties, the struggles that we, that we have throughout our lives. Um, one thing that I, that I find really um, helpful for people is actually understanding why they're doing that in the first place. And I think once that has kind of been brought into their conscious mind, um, it kind of helps in, in most things psychologically, actually, once it's sort of brought from our unconscious to our conscious mind, it's, it actually kind of deals with 50% of the problem in some way, um, because many of our behaviours and responses are so unconscious that, uh, you know, we're totally blind to ourselves. I think humans tend to be, we're very quick to sort of assess and weigh up others, um, but tend to be pretty blind to our own failings and faults and, you know, flaws and difficulties and struggles. So for me, it's about understanding maybe why we do that and, and actually having the courage and the bravery to accept that, yeah, we have maybe hurt other people and maybe they haven't done anything to necessarily deserve that, but that actually it's a need that we need to kind of locate and work on within ourselves before we can ever hope of having a healthy relationship. You know, because you could have a relationship with the best partner in the world, but if you don't have that sense of yourself within that, it's not going to work because they can never validate you as much as you're ever going to need. Um, and why should they? You know, nobody nobody should have to do that for another human, really, should they? Um, so, yes, certainly therapy, understanding why you're doing it. But, um, you know, other t tips and um, tools that I use, I mean, I talk about journaling an awful lot, but uh, one of the really helpful things is um, affirmations. And um, people kind of have mixed thoughts about affirmations. I think people feel embarrassed about affirmations you know nobody particularly wants to sort of look at themselves in the mirror after they've cleaned their teeth in the morning and said I am great it's it's kind of a cringe worthy thing to do um affirmations do work um and people who I think find they don't work is because they've given up too early or they're um perhaps not doing it in a way that I would suggest um it's done and you know that's not to say I have the answer but the ways that I have found affirmations work are First of all, um, is to record them in your own voice. And these days, most smartphones have that sort of voice recording functionality where you can sort of record it in your own voice. Um, but I think the reason why that works is because your brain doesn't have to kind of decode the voice. It's your own voice. And so it kind of penetrates quicker um, and more effectively. Um, and playing your affirmations um, when you're doing something else. So it really is your subconscious, your unconscious kind of processing that and internalizing that. If you're listen, sitting there listening to an affirmation, consciously you're going to be fighting that. Your cognitive kind of part of your brain is kicking in and you're going, well, that's not true because that's not who I am. You know, that kind of thing. So affirmations for me work best when you're doing something else, like chopping the vegetables or making the bed or putting your makeup on. So you, when you're actually cognitively focused on something else, affirmations can work better. So find a time um, of the day where you're, uh, I don't know, whatever it is that you do every single day, like cleaning your teeth, you wouldn't even question it. Maybe do it while you're cleaning your teeth. Turn the water off so you can hear it and save water. Um, but, you know, what I'm trying to say is find five minutes every single day, five, ten minutes every single day where it's just part of your routine. You're not actually thinking about the words that you're hearing. They're just going in. They're just sort of, you know, penetrating your subconscious, rewiring some of those some negative thoughts. Um, the reason why they work is, I think, I think it's called self-affirmation theory, um, and it goes to the sort of the ego self, and, you know, we, it's very hard for a human to admit where they're not, um, where they could use help or improvement, um, and I, I think that's just a feature of being, um, a human being, and, but actually we have to do that, and in order to grow, um, to grow psychologically and to develop ourselves, we've got to look at, what we need to work on. Um, for me, affirmations are brilliant for that. So just record them into your phone on repeat. You know, the, the things that you want to um, change and believe about yourself, like, you know, I, I, I don't need to rely on somebody else. 
I, I do have what I need to feel safe within me. I am a, a strong, you know, a strong surviving adoptee. I have gone through some of these difficulties. Um, I have everything I need within myself. And, and it for me, it is that core message of saying to the self, uh, you know, that's not to say because, you know, just to sort of reiterate, it's not about not being in a relationship. It's about not being in a relationship because you can't be on your own. I think there's there's a big difference there. And so then you can go into a relationship, as I say, that's a healthy one, rather than you kind of looking for that hit of validation or um, being worthy that is sort of given to you by another person. Um, affirmations need to happen um, every day, like I say, for five or 10 minutes um, while you're doing something else, but, but not like, ongoing you know that's a, an ongoing process um, we know they work they work in all sorts of fields um, for people and visualization and, and affirmations these these are going directly to the sort of the deeper part of our brains and changing things at a very deep deep you know level so for me they work um, as I say journaling meditations all of those things but the issues surrounding relationships for adoptees have to be worked on from the perspective of the adoptee first. Now, unfortunately, when people are contacting me saying it's their partner that's that's struggling, that is a tricky one because any kind of self development or self help, um, you know, I hate to use that kind of self help thing, but self development has to come from the person themselves. It will never ever work if it's just suggested. Uh, actually, I'll go. I'll just come back off that. Actually, no. In, in the past in the dim and distant past I used to work in um, a, uh, a counselling agency for um, gambling addiction and very often those clients used to come because they were told to come <laughs> however they in, in a few cases they did then recognise the benefit of it and sort of embrace it for themselves but I think the thing is it's it's a different thing you know as an adoptee we don't want to think of ourselves as having a problem you know if you're sort of gambling and hiding that from everyone you sort of it's hard to trick yourself about what you're doing, but it, you know, being an adoptee, it's a bit different because a society's not acknowledging that that's a problem. B, you don't want to acknowledge yourself that you've got trauma or difficulty as a result of being um, an adoptee. And 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 thirdly, it's so much easier to blame the relationship. Um, and so it's it's really hard um, to kind of say to an adoptee, oh, this is your problem. Um, I understand that. I understand that difficulty. Uh, all I can say is, um, if you want to recommend that people kind of look into the material or or read up or do some research on this, it's it's doing it for them, not you. Um, maybe that would be a, a way in which they could receive that better without feeling threatened or sort of put down or or you know. I know. I know it's tricky. And um, yeah, partners of adoptees. Um, they do get hurt. They do get hurt. Unfortunately, in most cases, or fortunately, <laughs> I don't know which, the um, the person who's doing it, they, they don't understand the reasons. Um, so as adoptees, there is a lot to do, really, to try and strive towards living with well-being. As I said previously, my research looks at the things that can be done growing up that would help that to happen later on. And uh, that's, um, but that's a separate topic. That's you know, for those future adoptees who, um, you know, are being brought into homes and families and what those families can do to to help them adjust later in life because the psychological adjustment is absolutely enormous. There's so many different aspects to it, such as genetic bewilderment, identity formation, um, separation trauma, separation anxiety, you know, so many different aspects to it that are never spoken about or have traditionally let's say never been spoken about and those are the things that need to be changed at um, a young age within the environment within the family so as adults we have a harder job because none of that was happening and so you've got this whole um, kind of um, narrative of why do you feel like you do and should you feel grateful and um, lucky you you know somebody rescued you kind of that kind of thing and so it's unhelpful, unfortunately, um, because 
yes, you know, you could be in the best family in the world and you could be the most loving family in the world. It's not about the family, or sometimes it is, but it's not, you know, essentially it's about the individual and that individual takes those problems later on into their relationships, unfortunately. Anyway, so um, I hope that was uh, helpful in, in terms of kind of um, helping to explain why relationships end up being such a problem for adoptees. It's this need for validation. Um, and, you know, eventually people kind of just go back to their sort of normal lives, the whole kind of glossiness of the first years sort of wear off, life settles down, and that's completely normal. You know, nothing, nobody could sustain the sort of the first few months of limerence of kind of crazy head over heels long term that wouldn't be natural but unfortunately for many adoptees when that does fade that's when the adoptee is facing themselves and their reality and their truth and so it's much easier then to sort of think well where can I get that from now and so sometimes they're looking for the next hit um, from a fresh source who's willing to do that <laughs> and uh, yeah it's just very tricky very tricky indeed um, so it's about working with with what we have, which is ourselves. Um, so I hope you found that helpful and uh, I will see you. We'll see you next time. There are things to announce. Um, as I said previously, there's a few things coming up in the calendar, but they're still very much in development. So I don't really want to say anything too much on that at the moment. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's nice to put out a video and just sort of touch on that topic, as I said, which I hear lots about um, from much of the contact that I get. It's This problem comes up again and again and again. So I hope it's helpful. All right, I'll see you soon. Bye.